Good morning. And welcome to the Museum of the San Ramon, San Ramon Valley's virtual speaker series. I am Dan Dunn, the director of the museum. Last month, textile artist Dolores Miller shared with us the story of the art quilt and the difference between its cousin, the traditional quilt. The Tiburon Peninsula, which includes the town of Tiburon and the city of Belvedere, was home to cattle ranchers and dairy farms dating from the land grant to John Thomas Reed in 1834. With the arrival of the railroad and ferry terminus at Point Tiburon in 1884, the peninsula became an industrial and maritime center, as well as a residential and tourist destination. From the gold rush to the building of ships for the war effort during World War II, historian David Goth will explore, will explore the varied history that this scenic area has played in the maritime life of the Bay Area. David has been the town of Tiburon historian since 2015 and has recently retired as the archivist for the Belvedere Tiburon Landmark Society. He continues to make short films about the history of the Tiburon Peninsula using the vast collection of photographs and information contained in the archive. Please use the chat window at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you have. Feel free to send in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address them at the end. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome in David Goth. David? Hello, thank you, Dan. Happy to be here. I will start this program with a short video that I created about the history of the railroad coming to Tiburon, which gives a general overview of a little bit of the history anyway. And then we'll go to a PowerPoint presentation, which will cover the maritime industries that occurred on Belvedere and Tiburon since then. Much of the way downtown Tiburon looks today is a direct result of the establishment of a railroad terminus here in the late 1880s. From the shoreline park and main street to the bike path that leads to town, the footprint of that original industrial enterprise remains. When John Reed was granted the 5,000 acres of the Rancho Corte Madera del Presidio in 1834 by the Mexican government, what is now the town of Tiburon was more water than land. Corinthian Island was indeed an island, and the whole of downtown was awash. Forty years later, the California gold rush had totally transformed the San Francisco Bay Area. Not only had the population exploded, but the silty runoff from the gold mining had begun filling up many of the shallow areas of the bay, including Tiburon. However, the Tiburon Peninsula was only sparsely inhabited. The only activities were the reed and lyford dairies, several brick kilns, a cod fishery, and an explosives factory. Everything changed when the railroad magnate Peter Donahue decided that Point Tiburon would be the perfect place for a ferry terminal to connect to his San Francisco and North Pacific Railroad lines, which ran up through Marin and Sonoma counties. In 1870, he had established a ferry connection to San Francisco for his Sonoma lines at a new town on the Petaluma River named for himself. Although the town of Donahue grew into a bustling community with machine shops, warehouses, a hotel, and many residences, the long ferry ride was never very popular. When the competing North Pacific Coast Railroad started building a line to Sausalito, it was time for Peter Donahue to make the move south. In 1882, he created the San Francisco and San Rafael Railroad to connect his new terminal in the Marin capital to Point Tiburon. To make way for his new rail yard, Donahue had to turn the Bluff Point and adjacent marshes into a plateau. He did so in record time with a new machine called the Steam Shovel and had crews working around the clock creating the flat land that we now know. This photo from about 1883, a year into the work at Point Tiburon, shows what the Marin Journal reported in November of that year. This point has made a grand advance. The waterfront has a fine ferry slip, long wharf, 
tracks, a depot, machine shops, a store, boarding houses, etc., part of which have already been built, and all of which will be by spring. To bring a rail line from San Rafael to Tiburon, Donahue would spend nearly $700,000 because the line needed three tunnels, extensive low trestles over marshes, and a dramatic high trestle at Trestle Glen. The railroad first went through the 1,000-foot Cal Park Tunnel, coming out at what is now Larkspur Landing, where it crossed the Cordomadera Creek via a 90-foot drawbridge. The track then crossed over marshland on a low trestle before reaching solid ground near today's village at Cordomadera Shopping Center. A second tunnel of 1,900 feet went through the base of Ring Mountain, parallel to what is now Highway 101. The rails emerged into daylight close to the site of Kol Shafar Synagogue before hooking east past the new Reed Station and along the pastures of the Big Reed Dairy Ranch, which is now where Bel Air School is. A final 600-foot tunnel came out above the site of today's Belveron and launched onto a massive trestle which crossed the marshlands which we now call Blackie's Pasture. The last two and a half miles were an easy run along the picturesque Richardson's Bay, nearly all of which was made into the multi-use path in 1970. The final section was carried on a low trestle over the edge of Tiburon Lagoon. The last vestige of this lagoon is the small marsh and pond behind Town Hall. It didn't take long for Tiburon to prosper and grow. By the early 1890s, as this fine panorama shows, the train yards and Main Street are well established, with many of the buildings seen here actually barged down from the abandoned town of Donahue including the large Sonoma House Hotel on the corner of Main Street and the four matching 12-room boarding houses along the lagoon. For the next 60 years, the railroad defined the character of Tiburon, a bustling, hard-working community built on one of America's greatest industries. Okay, so now we'll go into a PowerPoint presentation which will carry uh, you along with photographs from the Landmark Society archives. I don't have my video up. Is my video up? Nope. All right, thank you. Um, so this is going to uh, go through the various different maritime industries around the Bay, Bay around the Belvedere and Tiburon Peninsula, in, uh, San, which is right across the bay from San Francisco. So we'll... The significance of the railroad coming to Tiburon cannot be understated. It totally changed the landscape of the peninsula forever. This is one of the earliest photos of Tiburon Harbor circa 1885, with a large hotel on the shoreline and the railroad, most of the railroad terminus off to the right. Along with the railroad on the ground came ferries on the water. Although this, Although this is not the first maritime activity in the peninsula, it was the most influential. Making the water connection to San Francisco opened up the peninsula for the residential development for the first time. Launched in 1889, the San Francisco North Pacific Ferry Ukiah was the largest ferry built in Tiburon and at 291 feet was only the second largest ship on the entire West Coast. It could carry up to 1,200 passengers and 12 rail cars on the lower deck. The harbor in early 1890s with the double-ended Ukiah at their home port on the right side where we, she was launched right in front of Main Street in Tiburon. Two towers conceal gallows wheel frame 
which raised and lowered the dock apron depending upon the tide to make it level for rolling on rail cars. Passengers disembarked from the Ukiah at the far end of the Tiburon Terminal. The depot building is on the left, which we'll see later. This large crowd is probably headed to the drawbridge, which connected Tiburon to Belvedere for opening day celebrations. The Tiburon Depot building and wharf about 1903, train number three to San Rafael and points north awaits arriving passengers. Horses and buggies on the right are there to take passengers to nearby Belvedere. In the background, you'll see the pilot house of the arriving ferry at the wharf. This detailed panorama from about 1890, which featured, which was featured in the movie, shows the Tiburon waterfront and only part of the expansive Northwest San Francisco Northwest Pacific Rail Yard. On the far left is the Tibur ferry Tiburon. Behind it is the James M. Donahue, it's an elegant side wheeler pulling into the long dock, which is piled high with cut lumber to fuel the locomotives. Center right. Is main beyond the yard is town of Tiburon and Main Street, curving in the middle past the island, which was called Valentine's Island until it was later named for the yacht club at the end, the Corinthian Yacht Club. Belvedere Island is beyond, and the hills of the Marin Headlers beyond that. Many of the buildings you see on this main in this photograph were destroyed by a windswept fire in early 1906. Looking down from the opposite direction, post-fire, the street has been rebuilt with more functional, less elegant buildings, including the large McNeil McDonough building on the water side. This is the oldest structure on Tiburon's Main Street, and we'll see this later all the way up to today. This view of the harbor gives a good perspective on how the terminal was laid out. The Ukiah again in the foreground with the gallows wheels loading rail cars, the James N. Donahue at its dock in the center. And in the distance is the passenger terminal with passenger cars bringing uh, passengers to the ferry depot, which is also still standing today. As you saw those that first shot, the Ukiah was in here unloading passengers at this tower. And this is Mar West Street, if you've ever been to Tiburon. And most of these houses are still there, and we'll see that later in the show. The James M. Donahue, named for Peter's son, was built in 1875. Finally appointed ship was the mainstay for travel from San Francisco to the town of Donahue on the Petaluma River. Peter Donahue himself brought guests and dignitaries over from San Francisco aboard the ferry to open the new Tiburon ter Terminal on May 1st, 1884. Once the double enders came into service, she no longer was useful and was moored in Tiburon from 1916 and slowly dismantled until she was sold in 1924. From the establishment of the ferry terminal in Tiburon until the arrival of the Ukiah in 1890, the ferry Tiburon, built in 1884, was the queen of San Francisco North Pacific ferries and remained in service until 1925. Tiburon was among the first ferries to carry horseless carriages. This group of happy automobilists pose as they head back to the city from adventures in the North Bay. There's much to see in this panorama of the entire yard from about 1922. Most significantly, there are no more passenger cars in the foreground. This is because in 1907, numerous Northern California railroads, including the San Francisco North Pacific, merged and became Northwestern Pacific Railroad. And by 1909, all, nearly all the passenger service from Marin to San Francisco moved to Sausalito. Tiburon continued as a freight service and as a maintenance center for the Northwest Pacific. And it was always a maintenance center as you can see here, all these are buildings that maintain the car, engines and cars. Here's the ferry depot. This is the passageway, which the passengers came in before, but now it's just freight and, and a service like that. Here's the James M. Donahue with it's missing its stack at this point. The Corinthian Yacht Club, which we'll see later in the program. Main Street Tiburon is down here. But what is of note is the fact that there was a giant lagoon that ran from San Rafael Avenue at the far end, separating Richardson Bay from the lagoon and it went all the way up behind Main Street. This land, this water has all been filled in the meantime and we'll see progressive photos of that, how that looks. Here's one right here. This is that large lagoon, still water back here, San Rafael Avenue back here. 
Um, the railroad tracks come right this way and spread out the maintenance yards here. The depot no longer has any uh, traffic by ship because it, it doesn't, uh, it was a passenger depot mainly. This is the dock for the railroad uh, ferries to come in and later barges. Another one over here for cars, which we'll see later. This is Main Street, Tiburon. And all this is now filled in. And we'll talk later about a drawbridge that occurred right here. And you can't see me pointing. Huh? Unfortunately, I, I, apparently I, you can't see me pointing, but anyway, uh, in the center is downtown Tiburon. To the left is what was called Valentine's Island, now Corinthian Island. And you can see that most of the water is being filled in behind Tiburon. On the far left is Beach Road, and we'll be visiting that shortly. Um, the, uh, at this point, the road, if you've ever been to Tiburon, comes straight into downtown Tiburon, didn't exist yet. It wasn't cut through the hill you see in the center and came straight through until it arrives in Tiburon after they'd filled up this whole area. After more than 30 years of service, including heavy work hauling for the military during World War I, the Ukiah went to Oakland Shipyard and was rebuilt and renamed as the Eureka in 1922. The Eureka could accommodate 2,500 people when used exclusively for passengers, could carry as many as 120 automobiles on the main deck when chairs were removed, and also carry 1,500 passengers on the upper decks. Power for the Eureka was the same three-story tall walking beam engine that powered the Ukiah, seen here during the rebuild in Oakland. Oil was burned in the boilers to produce steam, which drove 65-inch piston through 12 feet stroke, producing 1,700 horsepower. Perched atop the engine sticking out above the top deck was the walking beam, which changed this up and down piston action into rotary motion by connecting rod directly to the paddle wheel shaft. Twin 27 foot wide paddle wheels made 24 revolutions per minute. Oops. I believe that video is not going to play. Fortunately, that was a video of the Eureka in action, but apparently many things are not working as they should. Why is there? Tiburon Waterfront and Corinthian Island in 19, from, from Corinthian Island in 1927 shows the newly built automobile ferry dock in the foreground, with two, two of the three diesel ferries docked beyond. These ferries were put into service specifically for uh, carrying automobiles from Tiburon and it wasn't very successful because of the single lane road to Tiburon was difficult to navigate. And it ended up that these ferries were used from Sausalito instead and later sold to Washington State Ferries and operated to the islands off of Seattle for many years later. On the left is Main Street with the back of the McDeal McDonough building, which we'll see later. The small ferry boat in the foreground is Marin, and it was used to take passengers from Tiburon via Belvedere to Sausalito once the passenger ferry traffic stopped to Tiburon. This operated from 1912 to 1934, at which time the run to Sausalito was done by Greyhound bus. This is a view here and in down, way down in the bottom, you'll see a little dock sticking out of what is the island of Belvedere, and that is where the, Tiburon, the Marin Ferry stopped and picked up passengers. And in the background is the hills of Tiburon, on the right, Corinthian Island. In the center is Beach Road.
Hey, David, we seem to have lost your sound. Is my microphone working now? Somebody tell me. We got me. you now. Yeah, we got you now. Thank you. Now we can continue. You'll notice that there are three flat cars behind the engine loading the barges onto the ferry, onto the barge, and those are to keep the weight of the engine off the apron, which uh, raises and lowers depending on the tide. You can see this is low tide. The rail cars are well below the regular surface of the dock. The last workshop closed in 1963, and on September 25th, 1967, the final freight train left Tiburon. Ferry service was restarted from Tiburon to San Francisco in 1962. And today's service is provided by Golden Gate Transit. And here's 110 years of history between uh, 1908, Odo, you earlier saw, and 19, in 2018, you can see a number of the houses in the background are still there. The railroad and ferry depot is still there. And the uh, building we call the McDonough McNeil building on Main Street is still there too. And we'll see other shots of these. This is the railroad ferry depot in 1903, as you saw earlier. And here it is today. The Tiburon Railroad and Ferry Depot Museum opens on Wednesdays and weekends, April through October, and on sunny Sundays in the, in the winter. See the Landmark Society website for more information. Salvage and breaking up large ship, obsolete wooden ships was a common practice around the San Francisco Bay from 1850 until the 20th century. Along Along the shores of Tiburon Peninsula, there were many ships broken up about 1880 until the early 1890s. Initially, the Belvedere Cove and the Tiburon Harbor were used for this. The process was to remove any useful parts, including large structures such as cabins, and the ship being beached and set on fire at low tide, they picked up scrap metal. The huge Pacific Mail steamship China being dismantled in Tiburon Harbor. This image was from 1886. The Social Salon, Saloon, which was behind the paddle wheels you see in the center, was taken off the deck and put on pilings in Belvedere where it remains today known as the China Cabin. Because the railroad ferries were busily operating out of the harbor, ship breaking operations were moved to California City Point on the east side of Tiburon, and the China was moved there for its final destruction. This is the California City Point or Ring Point area. It shows uh, California's, the California's capital, which was a riverboat to Sacramento. This is Ring Point. This is Ring Mountain, if you've ever been on the backside of Tiburon. And this is Paradise Drive going right through here. And this is where a number of ships were uh, demolished. By the 1880s, a small field, fleet of schooners based in San Francisco journeyed to the North Pacific and fish for cod off the Alaska and Asiatic coast. The fish was brought back to the bay for cleaning, drying, and packing market. The earliest cod fishing was done, it was landed in Beach Road in Belvedere at the time was called Still Island. And so this was Still Island Shore. And this sketch by Captain Edwin Moody from 1846, one of the founders of the San Francisco Yacht Club, described the two vessels depicted in the Cove and Far Lagoon as returning with codfish from the Asiatic coast. The activity on shore were crews of both vessels engaged in curing fish on the beach of Still Island. The Timiranda on the right was owned by Matthew Turner, who, who was credited with discovering the commercial value of codfish found in the North Pacific, and who is better known as a shipbuilder. The 1864 voyage was the first with ships expressly fitted for cod fishery in the North Pacific. One of the earliest photos of Beach Road in Belvedere, it's the same place. This is on the far left is where they were drying that cod fish many years before. In the background, you'll see a large building, which is a cod fish uh, drying curing station. We'll see a few more photos of that. And just behind the sailboat is the China cabin on its pilings. 
on Beach Road. And as, it, as I mentioned before, it came from the ship and was brought here in 1886. Renamed the China Cabin, it was carefully restored by the Landmark Society in the early, 18, the early 1980s. This is a rare example of Victorian era shipbuilding and is open to visitors on weekends, April through October. Looking down a beach road from Valentine's Island, later named Corinthian Island, in 1896, buildings include William F. Stone's built building shop on the right, the Todd Fishery Postling Plant Work Workers Bunkhouse owned by Nicholas Bichard, connect to that, a very odd, odd structure composed of the bow of a former cod fishing ship, the Tropic Bird, with a two story residence attached to the store, to the shore. There are a few dwellings on pines, including the social hall from the steamship Kaina. Bichard is also in the ship salvaging business, so these structures belong to him as well. In the distance is a thin causeway that connects San, San Rafael, called San Rafael Island, that connects Belvedere to the Tiburon Peninsula. And in the foggy distance, you can see Mount Tamalpais. This is Beach Road in 1907. Looking straight down Beach Road, on the right is the Hotel Belvedere. Next to that, the Far Cottages, which are still in existence. A number of those uh, shacks and buildings we saw before, the Tropic Bird. Beyond that, on the right side of the road, you'll see the Cod Fishery still. And in the, in the middle is the drawbridge that connected Belvedere to Tiburon and basically Tiburon to the rest of the county. So this road in the foreground, although it's now called Beach Road, was called the County Road at the time. Uh, Corinthian Island, or at this point became Corinthian Island in 1907. The big body of water on the right is the Belvedere Cove, which then connects out into the San Francisco Bay. A large body of water beyond is the Tiburon Lagoon, which I mentioned before, which stretched all the way from San Rafael Ave to the back of Main Street. And in the distance, you see the paint shop, the long building for the railroad yard. And up on the left, the large two-story building is the first Tiburon schoolhouse and up on the hill, Old St. Hillary's, or St. Hillary's Mission Church to be exact at this point. Another view looking down the Belvedere Cove in the foreground, Arcs on floating houseboats in the bay. Um, Beach Road again, the hotel on the left in the distance, Tiburon Hills. People often ask, what happened to all the trees? Well, there never were any. Um, most of the trees are scrub oaks that would grow in the valleys and on where the water flows down. All the trees you see now, the very wooded Tiburon Hills, if you ever come over, are all been planted since about the 1920s. On the far shore, you'll see in the distance against the hillside, you'll see a bunch of arcs that have been put up on blocks. Oftentimes they would put them over there and then bring them out in the water for the summer. Some of these were then permanently put up on blocks and that's where people lived, often railroad workers, because that is right next to the railroad tracks. Far left is the Hillarita Dairy. There were three dairies along the Tiburon Peninsula. And this one is at the site where Reed School, Reed Elementary School is today. One last look at uh, Beach Road. Now the cod, large cod fishery has been placed, replaced by the elegant Pacific Motorboat Club. And you can see a much better view of the drawbridge in the center. And the barn on the left is uh, for the horses and carriages that greeted the uh, ferries and bringing passengers over to Belvedere. Now we move to Belvedere's West Shore, st again, still talking about cod fishing. In 1867, Thomas McCollum financed and outfitted his schooners for cod fishing trip to the North Pacific. He was considered the first to permanently engage in codfish business on the West Coast. In 1876, McCollum set up a curing station to salt and dry fish on the West Shore of what would eventually be named Belvedere, an enterprise that flourished until 1937. He paid $200 for about six acres of Thailands, choosing the spot because of the deep water close to shore and lots of sun. It was known as Pescada Landing and later Union City. Seen here from the ship on Richardson Bay, this is a rare photo that shows Belvedere with very few trees. Belvedere Land Company planted 15,000 trees in the 1890s. By the early 1900s, West Shore operation expanded with a salt barn and improved bunkhouses on the left. 
and the large processing buildings on the right. By this time, as you can see, the hillside is fully forested. McCollum, along with Lind and Ho Cod Fishery on the east side of Tiburon, formed a sales agency, Union Fish Company, and in 1904, the two firms merged under that name. During the 1930s, the companies expanded from simply drying and packing cod to canning fish, including salmon. The Union Fish Company still is in business today as a seafood importer based in Marin County. A fire destroyed a large part of the plant in 1937, which ended the cod fishery business in Belvedere. Two years later, the Union Fish Company sold its site to the Belvedere Land Company, which rented out the buildings that remained as housing. First renters about 1941 were sculptor David Lemon and his wife, painter Jerry O'Day. They were joined by several other artists, creating a well-known bohemian col colony along the shore. David Lemon, in about 1962, heading out from his home, this which he had named Pescata Gallery, a nod to the old cod fishery. The buildings were raised in the 1960s, making way for dredging and filling the shore, which became West Shore Road, an enclave of beautiful waterfront houses. Now we move over to the Tiburon's East Shore. This will be the shore of Tiburon that faces Richmond and Berkeley. Lind and Ho Company bought 12 acres of tidelands that had deep water close to the shore on the east side of the Tiburon Peninsula in 1877, and then 50 acres of adjacent upland from Benjamin Lyford in 1882. The company operated in the same fashion as McCullum Plant on the west side of Belvedere, receiving codfish from Alaska, drying and processing it. This is drying in the sun. These things were called flakes, where they laid out the uh, codfish and they could be tipped to follow the direction of the sun, just like solar panels do today. Linden Ho Company bought 12 acres of tidelands. When the two companies merged into Union Fish Company, the operations were consolidated in Belvedere. Linden Ho Property sold the tidelands and the upland property the U.S. government for $80,000 in 1904. Now we follow a number of industries that occurred on this exact same site that where the cod fishery was. First, the Navy immediately began constructing a coaling station for the Pacific Fleet. Seen here in 1907, the cod fishery buildings are being removed. Secretary of Navy report reported in 1908 that the wharf, trestle, coaling, hoisting towers, power plant, cable railway, and open storage bunkers were now in operation. Storage capacity at the time was 20,000 tons of coal. There were other stations located in Mexico, Puget Sound, Alaska, and Hawaii. At noon on May 6, 1908, a great parade of U.S. Navy ships steamed through the Golden Gate into San Francisco Bay. There were 42 vessels, including the 16 white hull battleships of Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. San Francisco was then the halfway point in the fleet's historic goodwill cruise around the world. It is estimated that a million people watched from the hills, wharves, and boats as the fleet came. The coaling station on Tiburon's east side completed just in time, the destination for many of the vessels arriving in San Francisco. The big Navy ships consumed coal by the thousands of tons, so the visit of the Great White Fleet was a dramatic start to the coaling station in Tiburon, which would coal vessels for more than 20 years. So you can see in the distance there between Tiburon and Richmond are the several of the Great White Fleet waiting to coal. Since steaming coal suitable for Navy ships could not be found on the West Coast, it was shipped on colliers all the way around from the East Coast and reloaded, unloaded at the station. Gigantic coal hoisting towers scooped up the coal from the storage areas, placed it in small cable railways, which scurried around racetracks, dumping their load into ships or onto barges. Workers and their families living at the depot drove two and a half miles by a Tiburon Boulevard, now Paradise Drive, into town to buy groceries, pick up mail on Main Street, as well as attend local schools and churches. The active days of the coaling station lasted until 1930, when the oil complete, when oil had completely replaced coal. In March 1931, former Navy coaling station became the home for the California Nautical School, which was created by the state legislator two years earlier to train officers 
for the Merchant Marine. The coaling site loaned by the Navy to the state had exist existing facilities for the new school to use, docks, shops, buildings, and classrooms and barracks. Most of the coal had been shipped away, but some remained. Cadets found themselves shoveling coal and sweeping coal dust from the parade ground beneath the giant gantry as punishment for rules and fractions. In 1938, the school became the California Maritime Academy. In 1940, the Navy requested the Academy vacate the premises, and the Academy eventually found a permanent home in Vallejo. So the gantry you see above them was one of the, one of the gantries that carried the giant coal hoisting towers, uh, Kent Crane, uh, coal hoisting shovels. And you'll see that this part of the uh, operation is still there to this day. John A. Roebling and Sons spot six acres of land in three tidelands north of the coaling station at Point Chauncey. Roebling's bridge division had the contract to furnish and erect suspender cables for the Golden Gate Bridge. Wire was shipped from the East Coast, wound and reeled, and then barged to the bridge to be installed. In 1942, the property was purchased by the Navy. The most well-known occupant of the former cod, cod fishery site on Paradise Drive was the Tiburon Naval Net Depot. From 1940 to 1945, 100,000 tons of anti-submarine netting designed to defend the West Coast harbors against the attack were produced in this location. At the base, both enlisted men and civilians created nets and their suspension buoys deployed and maintained the nets. The net depot was commissioned in August 1940 with just two officers and a handful of riggers. Some of the equipment left over the control from the coaling station were used to get the operation underway. So you can see still one of the coaling uh, cranes is still there, the gantries are still there. A number of the buildings on the right are still there that were used all the way through and are still there today, as we'll see in pictures going forward. The road at the very top of the picture is Paradise Drive, exactly as it is today. Hundreds of men were trained in the first six months of operation. 85% of the net was placed in place by December 7, 1941. Notice had been given two days prior that all ship traffic in and out of the bay had to use designated routes to enter and leave the bay via swinging gates in the net. Seven miles of netting stretched from Sausalito across the San Francisco Bay to more or less uh, where the Maritime Museum is today. This undated aerial gives a great view of the nets in place, and you can see one ship being going through an opening on the far side. This view in 1942 gives a great look at the net depot in Tiburon's east side. In the distance, you can see again, Ring Point and Ring Mountain where the, where the uh, ship wrecking went on. Closer down is uh, a building that was a barracks uh, that is now Paradise Park along, Tiburon, uh, along Paradise Drive. The two bright white buildings on the far end of the operation here, that's the Roebling uh, station, uh, Roebling uh, originally built by Roebling, later part of the net depot. And various different buildings that we'll see going forward are all still there today. Massive concrete pad was poured where the concrete coal storage area was for hand assembly of the, of the anti-submarine nets. Specialized net tenders were used to drag the nets off the assembly deck and into the water and maneuver them into place. Nets were built at the depot and shipped out to be installed at other ports along the Pacific coast as well. The former Roebling site was put to use assembling smaller anti torpedo nets. During the war years, San Francisco Bay was one big naval base. It's amazing to see all these large ships right off Tiburon's east shore. You see some destroyers and some larger ships there. And in the right corner is the Roebling, original Roebling site. Ready for war during the war all along the Tiburon coast. From 1945 until 1958, the net depot was used to retrieve and store the nets. 
And now you can see the T-shaped dock, which is part of the Paradise Park along Paradise Drive. And you can see also that the Roebling building was reduced by half by a landslide that occurred in the uh, mid 50s. And for a while, the Net Depot continued to train men from numerous allied nations on assembly and operation of harbor netting. From 1961 to 1978, the property supported a number of marine oriented federal research facilities, including fisheries, marine materials research, and eventually became one of the earliest National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration facilities. In 1978, the federal government gave the San Francisco State University the majority of the property to be used to study the natural forces at work on the San Francisco Bay and surrounding wetland environment. The property was named the Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies in honor of then President of the University, Paul F. Roebling. So this photo is from uh, late last year, and you can see in the distance the white building. That was the movie theater when it was the uh, Net Depot. You can see on the left the last remnant of the gantry. Buildings in the background, including uh, up on the hill behind the oaks, is an old water tower that goes back to the coaling station days. And, and the majority of these buildings are actually go all the way back to uh, the early 1900s, and it's they're all still there today. And if you're ever out Paradise Drive. You can wander down there and look around the Woody Hill. It won't cause much fuss. There again, you see a nice view of the gantry. And this is looking south with the Bay Bridge in the far distance. And a friend went out and took a drone picture after he saw my uh, this, this uh, presentation and gives you a good look at what the place looks like, similar to the views we saw before with the rusty old water tower on the on the right and of course a lot of it's still there from the all the different activities been there even though it's no longer a military facility now we have a look at the yacht clubs of Tiburon and Belvedere San Francisco Yacht Club founded in 1869 was the first to be established on the west coast and among the earliest in the country the original anchorage and clubhouse were located near San Francisco's Mission Bay but inadequate depth of water and increasing industrial growth resulted in a move to Sausalito. The new clubhouse was built on the waterfront in Sausalito in 1877. On March 21, 1897, the clubhouse, along with its priceless collection of models, paintings, photographs, and club records were destroyed by fire. The club immediately built a new clubhouse in the same site. The building remains intact today on Bridgeway in Sausalito, and is the home for the Trident restaurant. Being near the ferry landing was convenient for commute to the city. However, the large ferries came into service. The wake created caused trouble for the small boats in the nearby yacht harbor. This precipitated another move. So in the center are the small yachts of the Yacht Club. The Yacht Club is the first building along Bridgeway you can see there on the left. In the distance on, that's Belvedere, you can see the cod fishery, the little buildings along the edge, that's where the cod fishery was. In the distance, of course, the treeless Tiburon Hills. And if you look closely um, at where the dock is, you see the little white ship, and that's the Marin docking to meet the big ferry to San Francisco. And then as soon as that ferry leaves, the Marin would go back, Belvedere, and back to Tiburon. In 1926, the club found a property on Beach Road in Belvedere where the once Grand Hotel Belvedere stood. And this is the Grand Hotel Belvedere in its heyday, about 1916 or so. Unfortunately, it had fallen into disrepair by 1925 and the Yacht Club decided rather than try to rebuild the building, they would demolish it and build a new clubhouse. In the meantime, the San Francisco Yacht Club rented the nearby Pacific Motorboat Club from 1927 to 1934 while the clubhouse was being built. And this again shows looking down Beach Road with the Belvedere, uh, the boat club in the foreground, and the view from the solarium or the upper deck of the boat club looking back at Belvedere. One look at uh, Belvedere from this era, the hotel far left. Uh, the motorboat club on the right and snow on top of Mount Tam. 
sometimes archives or collectors find great photographs that were taken exclusively at this moment because there was snow somewhere in the Bay Area. So but they help us with a lot of history. Here's a shot when the Boveda Hotel has, has been removed before they've started to build the, uh, the Yacht Club. Here's with the Yacht Club finished in about 1935. And again, the uh, Motorboat Club just down the road where they were staying for that time, up on the hill, St. Hilary's Mission Church. I like this photograph because the bill in the background is now producing what is the Belvedere Lagoon housing area, that's Peninsula Road, which eventually had has uh, beautiful houses on it. Again, the Yacht Club down in the foreground, treeless timber on hills. This is the Yacht Club in 1962. They needed to build a uh, new harbor and had built one for 175 berths behind a substantial breakwater. Here's how it looks today. And the club remodeled in 2007 and in 2019, the old Cove House, which was adjacent to the Belvedere Hotel, was raised and replaced with a new event hall. On March 16, 1886, a meeting was held in San Francisco with small boat yachtsmen with the intention of forming a new club. By April, the club had 25 charter members who sailed boats of less than 45 feet in length. Point Tiburon was chosen as a place to build a clubhouse and Corinthian became the name for the new club. The club leased one acre tip of what was Valentine's Island for the, for the clubhouse. A small wood building was built mostly by club members in the fall and in 1886 was painted red. The island was later named for the Yacht Club. Within a couple of years, membership had grown enough so that the clubhouse needed to be enlarged. In 1889, the main house was extended west. The basement area of both storage was added a veranda as well. And then 1890 members leveled that large rock that you saw in the last picture. The clubhouse is extended with basement uh, sleeping rooms and yacht boat storage here over on the right. And then behind you see what is now Corinthian Island in one of the first houses of the big mansion right at the very top by one of the owners of the Corinthian Island Company. Members of the Yacht Club gather on the clubhouse steps with their mascot, Dickie the Raccoon, in 19, 1890. Corinthians celebrated the opening of the drawbridge that connected Tiburon to Belvedere, allowing boats and other vessels to come out of the sheltered Tiburon Lagoon into the Belvedere Cove for the summer. And referring back to the very first slide, uh, or second slide, the large group getting off the ferry at the start of the show. We're probably coming to this set celebration, and here they are parading down Main Street. And this photograph is taken from the upper floor of the Cinema House Hotel, which was barged down from Donahue. Gathering the bridge for the original opening day on the bay. The Corinthian Island Company, successor to the original owner, Thomas Valentine. Sold one acre tip to the, of the island to the Yacht Club in 1908 for $4,000. Just two years later, the members voted an assessment to build a new clubhouse. The beautiful new two-story building with large protected porches was added on top of the basement, now called Pneumonia Alley. The bright white building was opened on July 4th, 1912. Celebrations at Tiburon Harbor for the opening of the new clubhouse. If you look, uh, you see, of course, Tiburon Main Street in the background, Tiburon School, as we mentioned before, in the distance, and Old St. Hilary's. On the left is uh, Corinthian Island with the yeah, edge of the lot, Yacht Club sticking out into Tiburon Harbor. As the Tiburon waterfront became more crowded with moored boats, discussions began about creating an enclosed harbor with many berths. Just as the neighboring San Francisco Yacht Club had done, Nearly at the same time, the club created an 84 berth yacht harbor and parking lot at the edge of Corinthian Island, which was completed in 1960. The club completed a major rebuild of the clubhouse in 1963. So here you see the club, the yacht club, Corinthian Island, Main Street on the right, 
Hebron Boulevard heading out of town. Um, all that area that we saw before, you can imagine everything that you see on the left where the Belvedere Lagoon one was, Lagoon is now was all water and extended one big body from the far San Rafael Ave all the way to the back of Main Street. So everything you see here on the right is all on fill. Corinthian Yacht Club began the annual blessing of treasure crafts in the early, in this 1980s, I mean in the 1970s. By the 1980s, an estimated 4,000 yachts were part of the annual parade, and it included sometimes naval ships as well. In 2011, the club celebrated its 125th anniversary, and the following year, the 100th anniversary of the beautiful white clubhouse. I just wanted to make note, the center section of this picture you see is Tiburon Hills as it looked in all the early photographs. And that's because the space behind Old St. Hilary's has been preserved as the Old St. Hilary's open space because these hills in Tiburon uh, contain a great number of rare wildflowers. And so the people of Tiburon raised the money to buy the land from their owners in the 1990s and created this uh, perpetual open space. So you get a view of what Tiburon looked like going all the way back. The Tiburon Yacht Club, the newest club in Tiburon, located on the east side of Paradise K Development. The club was at its beginning in 1965, about 10 years after the dredging and construction of the Paradise K Development. A group of yachtsmen and women formed the Paradise Yacht Club and organized and renamed Paradise Harbor Yacht Club in 1967. The Yacht Club set up headquarters and held its first meetings in a wooden barge left aground on the northwest corner of the quay after work had been completed on the harbor. Leased from the Pullman Company developers of, Paradise, developers of Paradise Quay, alterations and additions were made to the structure and all the work done by members, resulting in a pleasant clubhouse. So what we're talking about, the clubhouse is in the far right corner, or the far middle right at the end of the exposed uh, land on, the, on that last peninsula. That's where the clubhouse was. And of course the Yacht Harbor right in front of it. Paradise K, all again on fill, uh, was built during, uh, during the uh, late 50, uh, early 60s. Here's the Yacht Harbor in 1966, looking out San Rafael Bridge and Red Rock in the distance. This is it today. And the clubhouse is at the far end, as you can't quite see if you can make it out with the little green peak roof. That's where they moved the clubhouse to at the far end. With the development of Paradise K's North Spit underway, the clubhouse was demolished to make way for new townhouses. In 1999, construction began on the Harbor Breakwater and a new clubhouse, which was completed in November 21, 2001. Sorry. And another uh, person went out and took a nice aerial for me. And you'll see on the far on the bottom corner is where the new clubhouse is, and it's a wonderful view of Tiburon from the air looking south. And so since my arrow doesn't work, this particular photo doesn't help too much because I'm pointing out things that you can't tell I'm pointing them out. But anyway, in the front, you'll see the uh, Tiburon rail yard in about 1960, where everything is pretty much emptied out. All the fill has been done. Lagoon has been uh, built up in Belvedere. Uh, on the far left, you'll see a little re remnants of the cod fishery and uh, on uh, West Shore Belvedere. On the right, you can see the familiar dock and uh, platform of the uh, Net Depot right on the west eastern side of Tiburon, and then the distance Paradise K, just under construction of it having been uh, leveled up and filled. But that's the overall shape of Tiburon. And you can see why there were a number of maritime industries because there's so much coastline. And I thank you for enduring some technical issues, but if you wanna know more, you can always email me. And uh, I'm grateful to the uh, Landmark Society, which uh, is, uh, manages and maintains uh, Old St. Hillary's in the Wildfire Preserve, China Cabin, Railroad Depot Museum and Landmarks. Art Garden Center, as well as Landmarks History Collections, which is where all these photos pretty much came from, and visit Landmark Society.
Thank you. Answer some of these questions I'm seeing here. The railroad, um, the last train out was 1968. Um, it took about 15 years for it to all be cleared out in the uh, what is now Point Tiburon built. That's a question. Anybody else? Type me questions and I can hear read them. Size of the archive, someone asks. Um, I don't know how to compare what size is. There's probably 100,000 images, oral histories, things like that of Tiburon and Belvedere. It's located in the Boardwalk Shopping Center in, in Tiburon. No tracks left to be seen, unfortunately, but there is a remnant of the big trestle at Blackie's Pasture and the berm which the trestle landed on. So that's been preserved and you can walk up there and see where the tracks went when they left Tiburon. The bike path, of course, in Tiburon is the railroad right of way. And I guess that's it for questions. Um, so thank you, David. And thank you all for viewing this morning. I hope these technical difficulties aren't um, making uh, this program not as great because I thought it was uh, a great program. If you missed any of our earlier programs, you can find them by visiting the museum's website at museumsrv.org. Today's program will appear early next week. Join us next month on Thursday, June the 15th at 1130, when author and geologist Andrew Alden will take us into deep Oakland. Oh, uh, Andrew will show, uh, share with us Oakland's history underneath it all and reveal how it's silt, soil, and subterranean underpinnings are entwined with the human history and the future. As a reminder, our popular exhibition, Stir Crazy Quilts, Quilting During the Pandemic, is in the last couple of weeks. The exhibit closes on May 31st, so this is your last chance to get there. Also, the Museum's Gala at our historic 1888 Tassajara Grammar School will be held on July 15th. Go to the museum's website for information and tickets and for information about our upcoming auction online in July. If you like these programs and want them to continue, we ask that you make a donation by going to the museum's homepage, museumsrv.org and clicking on the donate now button. Also, the museum's in need of volunteers. If you can give us some time, uh, please contact the museum. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, stay safe and thank you for watching. Goodbye.